Did you know that there is an ancient Scottish tradition that states that if you're a landowner, you can declare yourself a lord, or in English, a lord or a lady? Think about the prestige. Think about the honor. Think about the ability to be snooty and look down on everyone. <laughs> Kidding, kinda. This video is sponsored by the awesome people at Established Titles. This company allows you to purchase a small plot of land in Scotland, at least one square foot. Hence, thereafter, you can declare yourself a lord or a lady. Put it on your luggage, put it on your credit card, and to make it official, they will send you the proof. Check this out, a framed proclamation with your unique plot number. You can actually look this up on a map. Now, no one can dispute you, or they will face your wrath. Ha <laughs> ha, kidding, kinda. This makes an awesome gift for any loved one, that is, your significant other, your kids, or even your pet. Established titles allow you to get a single, family, or couple's pack. Think about it. Two plots of land right next to each other? It's kind of romantic. Now folks, it's not all about the glory. Established titles will plant trees with every purchase, preserving nature and the environment all over the world. The company is renowned for its reforestation efforts. Right now, Established Titles has a big sale going on. If you hit the link below establishedtitles.com forward slash fphistory and use the promo code fphistory, you can get an additional 10% off. By hitting that link, you can make yourself a lord or a lady, help the environment, and put a huge smile on a loved one's face. My wife absolutely loved her gift. Uh, granted, she now insists I call her my lady and bow on a regular basis. Anyway, folks, or for those that hit the link, my lords and ladies, it is now time for the show. In the north-central part of the Iberian Peninsula was the isolated sleepy town of Madrigal de las Altas Torres. It had been renowned for very little until the spring of 1451, but on April 22nd of that year, it was here that a princess of Castile was born. Her name was Isabel, or anglicized Isabella. She was the daughter of King John II and his second wife, Isabel of Portugal. But her birth went almost unnoticed by the kingdom. There was no great celebration, no great announcement. The Castilian king, after all, already had a son and heir already. His name was Henry IV. He was born from the union of John II and his first wife, Maria of Aragon. Thus, it would seem that the young princess was destined at her birth to be nothing more than a mere footnote. Indeed, even the details of her baptism were unknown, which for most nobility would have been a noteworthy major event. Isabella's birth, some could argue, appeared to be almost unwanted. Perhaps this was a reflection of the poor state of affairs that Castile was in during the mid-15th century. The kingdom was falling apart, its economy was feeble, its nobility squandered their energy in bitter rivalries, and neighboring kingdoms, especially Aragon, were looking for ways to take advantage. To the south, the Nazarid dynasty continued to rule over Granada. After centuries of Muslim influence, they were the last kingdom of Islam left on the peninsula. Their power, too, was waning, but their mountainous kingdom was still well defended and held on as a bulwark of Islam. Thus, the Reconquista, that is, the Christian reconquest of Iberia, was at this time an almost intangible goal. To make matters even worse, John II, again the King of Castile, was a man who had very little interest in ruling. He gave almost full authority to his high official, Alvaro de la Luna, who for all purposes was the de facto king. It was Alvaro de la Luna who arranged for John and Isabel of Portugal to be wed, which Alvaro felt was more advantageous for Castile. 
King John, by the way, only found out who he is going to marry as he waited at the altar. Thus, Alvaro's power over the king was considerable. This stirred intense resentment in the rest of the nobility and eventually angered the queen. Isabel of Portugal had limited power, but her influence over the king would grow and eventually she won out. King John was finally persuaded to act. He had Alvaro executed in 1453 and then realized the mistake he had made. The responsibilities of his vast kingdom now fell squarely on his shoulders. The king couldn't take it. He descended into a major depression. Even when Isabel of Portugal gave him another son, named Alfonso, in late 1453, it simply was not enough to alter John's mood. The following year, 1454, the king died. His death would have major repercussions. Kristen Downey, the author of Isabella, the Warrior Queen, explains, quote, The loss of her husband was another blow to the unhappy Isabel of Portugal. She slipped into what chroniclers would call a profunda tristeza, or a deep sadness, speaking only seldom and staring vacantly into space, perhaps at first as a result of postnatal depression, and then from loneliness and grief. The young Isabella was left virtually parentless. Observers noted a condition that bound her tightly to her younger brother who shared her tenuous childhood. The two children literally clung to one another. Isabella's older half-brother Enrique, again Henry, took the throne when she was only three. King Enrique did little to nurture his younger sister and brother, and instead their relationship with him became a source of tension and fear. With such an unpredictable childhood, it was not surprising that Isabella took consolation in an institution that provided the greatest single source of stability, the Catholic Church. This child, who had lost her parents so early, turned to the Church for moral guidance, and in the process became extremely susceptible to its influences. Sin and punishment were reincurring motifs for Isabella, but within this construct her personality emerged, while she loved the New Testament, she lived by the morality of the Old Testament. Thus, she would always be inclined to claim an eye for an eye, then turn the other cheek." End quote. Now keep in mind this influence would affect her for the rest of her life. In retrospect, to some, she was a saint, infused by her God and committed to a holy war. And to others, she was the devil incarnate, a religious zealot who justified acts of wanton brutality with her religion. Isabella's childhood was a difficult one. She and her younger brother, Alfonso, were always in the shadow of the now King Henry IV. While the Castilian ruler had promised to care for his younger siblings, the reality of the situation was that their existence was always in threat. The king scarcely provided. At best, he would be indifferent. In these early years, the siblings only met rarely, but records of these family reunions have been lost to time. Hoping to keep her children out of reach, or at least out of the spotlight, the queen mother, Isabel of Portugal, moved Isabella and Alfonso to the rural town of Arevalo, less than a day's march from Madrigal de las Altas Torres. If there was a bright center to the universe, Isabella was in the place that was farthest from it. Arevalo was devoid of the finesse and culture of the Castilian court. It was a remote fortress with thick stone walls, cold in the winter, blazing hot in the summer. It was built primarily as a military bastion and not so much for comfort. The king would eventually send in soldiers to protect his family, but his men also served to keep his siblings in place, always with a watchful eye. Now, it's from behind these massive walls that Isabella grew up, protected, some would argue imprisoned, from a world that was disintegrating around her. Castile and Leon, as mentioned before, were descending into a dark age. Downey explains, quote, the instability of Isabella's family life mirrored conditions in the kingdom as a whole. 
The vacuum of leadership under the feckless King Enrique had permitted the kingdom to descend into chaos. The kingdom's nobles, who could have helped to rule in their regions, instead became brutal and bickering warlords, terrorizing the peasantry, cornering the resources of an increasingly impoverished land. Rape, theft, and murder were rampant. With no central authority on the peninsula, chaos reigned, and most of the residents of Spain lived as Isabella did, near or inside heavily armed compounds. The landscape was so dotted with the stone and wood fortifications that the central kingdom was named Castile or Land of Castles. The Spanish people lived indoors, crouched behind thick walls made of stone, peering out through tiny windows that served as arrow slits, scanning the horizon for signs of danger, existing in a state of perpetual readiness for conflict. Isabella grew up in a land that was almost perpetually at war." End quote. However, as much as Isabella was sheltered in her upbringing, she also had many powerful influences. Her grandmother, Isabel of Barcelos, also known as Isabel of Braganza, was an extremely intelligent woman. She descended from King John I of Portugal, who ruled over what the Portuguese called the illustrious generation. The children of this king became philosophers, scientists, artists, and included one particular boy named Henry, who would be known to history as Henry the Navigator, whose contribution, by the way, to world exploration cannot be underscored. Grandmother Isabel committed herself to the schooling of the young princess, painstakingly teaching her a broad education, including the Portuguese principle that seafaring and international trade, especially west into the Atlantic Ocean, would be a key to the future, a lesson Isabella would never forget. The young Castilian princess would be nurtured by those around her as well, her astute governess who was well versed in politics, the governor of Arevalo, whose children would become Isabella's playmates and in time would become her very loyal friends. It was said that she became an avid reader with an unbounded curiosity, consuming books voraciously. She was multilingual, comfortable not only in French, Italian, and Castilian Spanish, but also in Portuguese. She matured quickly, learning from an early age how to survive politically, that is, keeping her own thoughts private. Religion, too, would have an impact. The monks of the Franciscan monastery, conveniently located in Arevalo, would provide guidance. Furthermore, during her formative years, she was absolutely entranced by the book La Poncea de Francia, that is, the French princess, which recounted the life of Joan of Arc. In Joan's militant example, Isabella found herself. She, too, wished to be the embodiment of a religion and a defender of the faith. In time, she would get her chance. Meanwhile in Segovia, King Henry IV presided over his Castilian court. He was considered an unusual man who had a bold and imposing appearance, yet seemed to lack backbone and conviction. On one end, he was considered generous, as he would be a patron to the arts, not to mention sponsoring a remarkable building campaign. But as he grew more confident in his role as a sovereign, again taking the throne in 1454, he created for himself a gilded golden cage. He surrounded himself with ineffectual advisors who would scarcely disagree with his politics or his policies. While Castile Leon declined all around him, he would have lavish banquets and fiestas, growing ever more distant from the needs of his people and his kingdom. After all, if the peasants were starving, well, let them eat arroz con leche. He became extremely unpopular with his subjects, and his nobility began to despise him. Now, aside from a plunging approval rating, one of his biggest problems was that of succession. After 13 years with his first wife, he was unable to produce an heir, and so he married again. He took for his bride, Joanna of Portugal, or anglicized, Joan. The two were married in 1455 in Córdoba, 
She was the daughter of the King of Portugal and was described as being especially beautiful. It was also remarked that the only thing that surpassed her beauty was her sexual appetite. But despite that, it would be several more years before she would bear a child. Now, most historians agree that King Henry IV favored men. He surrounded himself with a charming, good-looking entourage. In particular, was the king's favorite, a nobleman by the name of Beltran de la Cueva, who would be given a seemingly endless amount of lands, titles, and money. Beltran's sudden rise in status at the Castilian court would be a major source of contention with the rest of the nobility. Eyes were especially raised when King Henry and Beltran would retire to the bedroom chamber together, and at times, the queen would join the two. As the years passed and no heir was produced, tensions escalated nearly to the breaking point. However, in 1462, the queen gave birth to a daughter, who was also called Joan. For the royal couple, it was a major sigh of relief. They had an heir at last. But then, the accusations began. The nobility began to rally behind the idea that the heir to Castile, the Princess Joan, was illegitimate. She was given the slanderous nickname, Joanna la Beltraneja, implying that Beltran de la Cueva was the true father. For the King of Castile, his troubles were only about to explode. Henry IV now had to move quickly in order to maintain his throne. His nobility was increasingly eyeing his siblings as potential replacements for the crown. Henry's solution was to get his brother and sister out of the way as much as possible, that is, without actually having to kill them. Isabella, at this point, was a political pawn that could be married off. In 1457, when she was only six, she was betrothed to Prince Ferdinand of Aragon. But this fell through the next year when a new king came to power in Aragon and looked to France rather than Castile as an ally. So searching for a new ally himself, King Henry then negotiated a new deal. Downey portrays this well. Quote, In February of 1464, when Isabella was not quite 13, her brother Henry accepted the English offer and agreed to give her in marriage to King Edward IV. This at once would make Isabella a queen, that is, the Queen of England. It might have been a generous act on Henry's part to ensure an illustrious future for his half-sister. Certainly, Isabella and Henry showed visible signs of affection from time to time. They did, after all, share some of the same interests, writing, music, hunting, etc. However, it is just as likely that the marital alliance was Henry's attempt to remove Isabella from the direct line of succession in Castile and relocate her to a distant land, especially at a time when rumors were brewing about his own daughter's legitimacy. End quote. The deal with the English would have been great, but later that same year it too fell apart when Edward IV disastrously decided to marry a lowly widow. Castile came out of this looking extremely foolish, and Isabella was infuriated that the English king had basically blown her off. Those around her knew that Isabella, due to the struggles of her early years, had become somewhat rigid and not one to forgive an insult. Some could argue that this was a character flaw, and others would perhaps say that this was a survival trait. In either case, Henry IV's search for a way to essentially get rid of Isabella would have to continue. Fourteen sixty-three found Isabella, now thirteen, on her way to Portugal to marry the King of Portugal, Afonso V, who was well twenty years older than she was. The proposal didn't go over well at all. Isabella refused to consent and the Castilian nobility had finally had enough of the wayward king who couldn't even seem to keep his own household in order. Rallying behind the Archbishop of Toledo, a man named Alfonso Carrillo, and a high-ranking nobleman named Juan Pacheco, the aristocracy declared their split. In a document known as the Representation of Burgos, they listed their numerous grievances and demands. Some of the most prominent points were banishing Beltran de la Cueva, questioning the illegitimacy of Princess Joan. The statement that they actually wrote down was rather blunt. 
It is quite manifest that she is not the daughter of your highness. And the final major demand was that Henry IV had to acknowledge his younger half-brother, Alfonso, the Prince of Asturias, as the heir to Castile. Henry caved in to all demands and stated, Know ye that to avoid any kind of scandal, I declare that the legitimate succession of this kingdom belongs to my brother, the Infante Don Alfonso, and to no other person whatsoever. The King of Castile was reduced to a laughingstock. Juan Pacheco alone would insult him in front of the court, but Henry couldn't take it for long. In an act of defiance, he backtracked on everything that he had previously agreed to. He first declared that his daughter was once again the only heir to Castile, and then just to really tick everyone off, he brought Beltran back to court and promoted him to the rank of Duke. The outcry was immediate. Castile fell into civil war. The nobility decided to rally themselves behind the young Don Alfonso, again King Henry's younger brother. Within a week, the cities of Burgos, Seville, Cordoba, and Toledo all rose up in rebellion against the king. Henry, with few other options, retreated to his stronghold in Segovia to figure out what to do next. Everybody else in the kingdom now had to pick a side. On June 5th, 1465, in the town of Avila, the nobles of Castile came together and burned an effigy of Henry. When the king found out, he was horrified, and thus, when he was presented with another round of grievances and demands, he once again acquiesced. But it was during these negotiations, for the first time, that Isabella was brought to the forefront. One of the demands was that she should marry the detestable Pedro Giron, the master of the Order of Calatrava. The man was vulgar, and it was mentioned that he had even made advances on Isabella's mother. To Isabella's horror, the marriage was agreed upon. Pedro, by the way, was the brother of Juan Pacheco. The marriage, he calculated, would have given his descendants the chance to become royalty. But as Pedro was making his way to meet Isabella, he came down with a terrible infection and died quickly. It would seem that trying to marry Isabella off had gone from being difficult, to being a cause for civil war, to being a death sentence. The civil war would continue as Castile fell further into a dark age of violence. Lawlessness was the new normal, and everywhere there was pandemonium. In August of 1467, the forces of the king met up with the army of Prince Alfonso, now 13 years old, and his supporters in the nobility, who were essentially running the show. The ensuing conflict was called the Battle of Almedo. It was inconclusive except for the fact that King Henry fled the battlefield in humiliation. He went to a nearby village to wait out the fighting. When the word got out that the king had acted like such a coward, his most loyal supporters left him. Even the city of Segovia, his home base, now pledged its loyalty to Don Alfonso, who was increasingly looking like the next king. When the young prince arrived later in 1467 to claim the city under his banner, the inhabitants welcomed him in. Isabella, who had essentially been sequestered in the city, now had a very difficult decision to make. She could continue to support her older brother, King Henry, or back up her younger brother, Alfonso. In front of the people of Segovia, she ran up to Alfonso and embraced him. In that one act, she had placed her future and her life in the hands of her younger sibling. And perhaps she had a really good reason to think this way. Alfonso was regarded as a prodigy, one that could bring balance to the chaos that had engulfed the Kingdom of Castile. As the war continued, Alfonso made considerable gains. Meanwhile, Isabella was delighted. She basked in the glory of her younger brother's success. But this brief time of joy was not to last. It was in July of 1468. Brother and sister were enjoying a meal in a village near a villa called Cardenosa. They were on military campaign to secure the kingdom. A chronicler at the time recorded what happened next. Quote, 
The King Don Alfonso was with His Most Serene Highness the Princess Doña Isabella, his sister. As they sat at dinner, he was brought a trout pastry, which he partook of willingly. Afterwards, he fell into a heavy sleep and went off to bed without speaking to anyone, a thing he never did. Those of his bedchamber came and felt him with their hands, and noted that his body did not emanate any heat. As he did not awaken, they began to call loudly, and yet he did not respond. The physician coming in haste ordered him to be bled, but no blood came. His tongue was swollen and his mouth seemed black. With no remedy availing, the innocent king gave his soul on July 5, 1468. His death was believed to have been brought about by poisonous herbs." End quote. Whether it was sickness or an accident or murder by poison was up for debate. What was certain was the situation that Isabella found herself in. Her younger brother was dead. She had betrayed and rebelled against her older brother, the king. She had no supporters, no husband, and was perched precariously high in the order of succession. She was a target, and she was alone.